Nikos Papastergiadis was invoked in, in uh, my presentation. And what we will now see is uh, see and hear is um, Nikos' own reflection on uh, an art critic and novelist whose work has had great resonance for many of us, John Berger. And I quote from what Nikos writes here. This lecture traces the imaginative swerve in Berger's writing that touches on such fundamental polarities as home and exile, connection and displacement, and violation and redemption in order to consider his enduring fascination with the artist's capacity to both see this world and to create others. So in Nikos' meditation, it, we move very much towards questions that animate and vex artistic practice and its uh, connection to other social and cultural practices. So. Greetings, friends and colleagues from Berlin. I'm sorry that I can't join you to be a part of this very important and very interesting event in Berlin. Um, and my deep thanks for the invitation, to, in particular to Ranjit, um, and to my other friends who are there. Hello from sunny Melbourne. Um, as a way of speaking to the key theme of this conference, I'm going to pick up three key terms that were central to the old left, the terms of truth, solidarity and justice. And I want to see how these terms are still resonant today or in what ways they've shifted. And I want to see how the word like truth, the, try, the attempt to try and see things as they are and not through some distorted lens that serves other hierarchies, or the idea of solidarity and how it's changed towards thinking about interconnectedness and equality amongst all, and the kind of equality and connectedness that produces a sense of unity but not at the expense of identity and a sense of justice and how this is now pursued in terms of the balancing requirements with others and with the world as a whole and the capacity to live a kind of virtuous life in contemporary forms. Now these key terms that were central to the left I believe also contained with them a certain approach to the world. The first, the pursuit of truth, was a kind of revelatory approach. The second, this idea of equality and interconnectedness, was a connective approach, a sort of projective, an outward thing. And the third one is a sort of what I call a harmonics, a mode of being and living in the world. Now, the understanding of these key terms and approaches in the past, in the post-war period in particular, was predominantly pursued through the categories of ethics and politics. Even in art criticism, the way in which we understood those terms was through primarily through those two categories. Now my concern today is to sort of try and balance this, not to challenge or contradict the validity or necessity of those approaches, but rather to balance this with a more direct examination of how such terms and approaches can also be understood through the category of aesthetics. In particular, I'll be focusing on the writing of John Berger. John Berger, for those who don't know, is a critic living in France today. He's also an artist, a writer, a novelist, a poet, a playwright, a drawer, a painter, a polymath in many ways. He uh, had his formative experiences during the Second World War, I would argue, where he served in the army, and then afterwards went to art school, became a painter and a critic. He was very much influenced by artists and scholars and philosophers and activists who had left Europe and settled in London in the 50s and 40s. John's first book was A Painter of Our Times. It's a portrait of a painter, an emigre from the former Soviet bloc country of Hungary, and his attempt to reconcile his own political and artistic ambitions. Throughout that period of time, he, 
John also became a regular art critic for the, for the New Statesman and New Society. Some of his more influential essays appeared in, in a book called Permanent Red. He was also very famously known for a, a portrait of a Russian artist, Ernst Nyesvesny, and the role of the artist in the Soviet Union, Art and Revolution. One of his most influential books and popular books was the, the critical book on Pablo Picasso, again exploring the relationship that an artist can have with the politics of his, his, of his epoch. So here was an author, a writer, who was very much involved with the Marxist critiques of his time, who was in a sense a strong Marxist, although never a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. And what I want to explore in this lecture is the subtle and significant shift in the f of focus in his art criticism. From this period in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when the, when the focus of his art criticism was to speculate on the social and political consequences of art, to the 90s and the, the last two decades, where there's been more of a reflection on the aesthetic process of creation and its articulation of a cosmos. Through this examination, I want to see how the understanding of these three key terms of truth, solidarity and justice, and these approaches, the approaches of revelation, connection and harmony, can also be re-understood and be given a different kind of flesh when they're seen through the aesthetic categories. In particular, I want to stress something that's very important. And that is, while John Berger's work, in a sense, can be seen as having shifted from a more empirical and political approach, in, the, in other words, how art has tried to produce changes in the world, to one that it can be seen as more metaphysical and aesthetic, and that is more concerned with the aesthetic processes, this itself, I want to emphasize, is not a regression. Preference of a kind of obscurantism over an engagement with the real. In fact, nothing could be more repellent for someone like John. What I think is happening is not a movement away from reality, but an attempt to get closer to it and become more clear about what actually happens when art is making its own world. To illustrate this point, this broad thesis that I'm trying to make, let's start with a recent review by John on Cezanne. The, view, the review, the essay, is, is entitled by a fabulous quotation from Cezanne, which is, colour is the place where our brain and the universe meet. Now, before going into some celestial speculation that, that this title kind of incites and provokes, let's reflect on, on how Berger himself charts the movement in Cezanne's work. He, he takes us through a movement from the revelation of the sensuous and sensory corporeality in which the human body is bound to, to a sensation of another corporeality that opens itself to an all-pervasive landscape. Here, Berger is drawing our attention to the connection between the perception of worldly impressions and the, con and the consciousness of an emergent form that opens itself to seeing how all works of art are, to some extent, a creation of the world. He gives us a glimpse of this via the concept of the black box that lurks in the painting. In a way, this is symptomatic and typical of Berger's approach to writing. He takes us into the particular and then to the general into the local and the cosmic, and he simultaneously compresses the two together and makes them feel they're coming out of your own body, coming out of your own aspirations and thoughts. And what is interesting to me is how he has not just got this gift for communication and on relation, but his capacity to track certain developments which are key at our particular point in time developments in the way in which we pursue these terms that I've begun with. And so what I will try and do from this point on in this lecture is show us how the act of imagination is connected to these ideas of truth, solidarity and justice. And how John's writing, in a sense, provides us one pathway for following 
our pursuit of these broader concepts and ideals. Now, in a sense, throughout all of Burgess' writing, the pursuit of the processes of aesthetic imagination are key. Of course, that would be typical of an art critic. And it, it, therefore, it would be useful for all of us to start with some kind of definition of what we mean by the faculty of imagination. Someone who I admire greatly and I'm sure is central to also Burgess' thinking is the great Gaston Bachelard. In this wonderful book, Bachelard also gives us a, a very neat and simple definition of, ima of imagination. He says, this is the faculty for producing new images. Not for recalling images from other places or from the past, because of course that's the act of memory, but for the production of new and novel images. Now, these images obviously incorporate elements from the past. They include details from elsewhere, but it's the way in which they are rearranged that, of course, is distinctive, that produces something new. In a sense, Burgess' criticism and has also followed this relationship to the past and the future, and what he, very in a very sort of um, mercurial way, defines as a kind of nostalgia for the future. This is one of his definitions for the way in which, the way in which imagination and memory are connected. Now, in the 50s, Berger was a kind of outspoken critic, one who was an advocate of certain kinds of social realism. He was not that patient with the emphasis given to formalist approaches in art. He was more directive towards the Marxist approaches towards art. But I would argue that even in that more strident and more combative strain of his writing, there was still a close attention to the relationship between creativity and what I call as cosmology. This is certainly something that has become more vivid in his more recent essays that are collected in, in books like this one, The Shape of a Pocket, or in more recent essay like Here is Where We Meet, and, and, a, and a wonderful collection called Hold Everything Dear. I'll come back to these three collections throughout this essay and throughout this lecture, but let me just begin now by talking more briefly and more broadly by how John Berger's work can add a little bit more to our understanding of what we mean by aesthetic imagination, how it is related to the, his to the notion of history and the past and politics and our place, and how, in fact, it is connected to this struggle to articulate a truth about our times. Now, for Berger, this status of a truth claim is not the same as the way in which we talk when we talk about truth claims in terms of legal definitions and sort of juridical de debates over what can be defined as true or false. It is not an empirical and purely rational account of truth. It's something that's far more complex and ambiguous. And it arises not just by the criteria, and it's not just established by the criteria for validation, but it's through emergence and how it arises, in other words, through our sensory faculties, and then how that sensory awareness of things is then cross-checked with more procedural elements of reasoned truth, thought practices. So this understanding of truth in, in art is, I would argue, one that is, requires a, a sort of different approach, one that is also coming out of one's sensory awareness of the world and not just one that's confined to these reasoned processes for validation and verification. And in that way, we can see how the truth claims are also fundamentally connected to this idea of the production of new images that come into the world through our sensory awareness of the world and which in itself is an articulation of a world. Now, again, let me say, like I said, let's step back to these earlier period when John was writing um, his famous essays for the Statesman and the, and the New Society and for various other left-wing magazines around London. During that period, he defined his stance in rather combative and critical terms. 
he was in a sense seeing himself as an advocate of, advocate for and a spokesperson for various kinds of movements and artists who were engaged with certain politics about confronting oppression and, and wanting to expand our awareness of our potential and having to expose the falsities and, and, and illusions and distortions and oppressions that were dominating both cultural and political life. Now, he was very conscious of that combative stance and he wouldn't shirk away from the necessity for that position and that the necessity for that struggle and need to confront. But rather what one sees now is not just this need to expose and reveal the truth, but also an emphasis on how we create a truth. In that sense, that shift from that period to the period where I'm talking about now in the last 10 or 15 years, we see a shift towards a creative and more fabulative or poetic kind of writing. And of course, we can align this shift to writers like Michael Tausig, Bruno Latour, and various other writers who are more conscious of the way in which the writing process is not just a revelatory activity, but also a creative and emergent practice. And in that sense, we can see how he shifted from thinking about how he needed to enter the field, this is Berger, to find a detail that reveals the, the different, different kinds of relationships that exist in a field, to a kind of more mysterious and magical kind of process by which something emerges from possibilities that arise from certain situations. So that emergent possibility, rather than that revelatory tendency, is something that I want to focus on. And how in that emergent possibility, we create a certain order, produce a certain kind of arrangement. And to quote one of the Chinese painters that appear in one of these essays, it is to save things from chaos. Now, in a sense, what I've been arguing is that while the early writer in its tone was more strident and more combative, it was also, from the beginning, more in, it was also still implicitly, if not always explicitly, interested in this creative process. And this, I think, has been something that has been overlooked in the way in which we reflect on his earlier writings and in those in the famous series of, of um, TV programs that he made with a, a number of people called Ways of Seeing. This was a very influential um, series of, of um, TV programs that of course resulted in the famous book which every undergraduate, and I was one of them, who um, experienced this and, and um, in many ways started anew in my, in my critical thinking. And, um, but through this series, we also see how ways of seeing is not just unseeing the conventional things, but also refers to a broader way of being in the world. It, it refers to a kind of wider scope of, and a wider frame. And it combines both a terrestrial and, I would argue, celestial perspective on seeing. Now, this becomes more explicit in, in the essays that appear in this wonderful book, The Shape of a Pocket. Let me just give you an indication of some of these um, changes that appear in his writing. He says at one page, at one point, our customary visible order is not the only one. It coexists with other orders, stories of fairies, sprites, ogres. These were all human attempts to come to terms with their coexistence. Hunters are continually aware of it and can read signs we do not see. Children feel it intuitively because they have the habit of hiding behind things. There they discover the interstices between different sets of the visible. This idea of discovering the interstices between the different sets of the visible which is a key theme in his current writing, of course was already there 30 years earlier, more than 30 years earlier, in the ways of seeing. And so I'm trying to make an explicit connection between his fundamental questions about how we see 
and our ability to find things that are otherwise hidden from us. And to highlight this point, I want to also take us to a, a very, very important um, passage in all, an equally meditative book which appeared much earlier, in 1984, which is called And Our Faces, As Brief As, Fo as Photos. And, sorry, And Our Faces, My Heart, Brief As Photos. This includes a very important passage about the ontology of being and how our sense of our origin is also a creation story. The story of where we come from and how we're related to a particular place is also a platform for establishing our way of being in the world as a whole. It doesn't just confine us to a particular point, but it opens us up to being part of the world. And in that passage where he talks about the significance of home and he relates the findings of the great Romanian anthropologist Mircea Eliade. He also talks about home not just as a centre of the real, but as this place for assembling the fragments and experiences of the world in order to open up paths for entering the world and creating broader senses of self-understanding. In this sense, he's not simply trying to validate traditional wisdom against contemporary kinds of alienation, but rather he's saying that this process of self-understanding that was implicit and explicit in the, in the mythological construction of the world is something that is still persistent and is still relevant to the ways in which we can understand the creative process as a whole. And this idea in terms of creation as a, as a way of self-understanding and self-exploration through connection between the particular and the whole is also appearing over and over again in the essays that I've just referred to in the collection Hold Everything Dear, which of course is a line from a Welsh poet. And in this collection there is a wonderful little passage which I'll read as a whole. A small brass bowl called a fear cup, engraved with filigree geometric patterns and some verses from the Quran arranged in the form of a flower. Fill it with water and leave it outside under the stars for a night. Then drink the water whilst praying that it will alleviate the pain and cure you. For many sicknesses, the fear cup is clearly less effective than a course of antibiotics. But a bowl of water which has reflected the time of the stars, the same water from which everything living thing was made, as is said in the Quran, may help resist the stranglehold. Now, in this very astute and brief passage, a number of things are being brought to our attention. Obviously, Berger doesn't take the complete story that it saves us, this fear cup, that it can save us from everything. And that he, at certain points, would rather be cured by antibiotics than by faith. Science is not irrelevant in this story. However, what he is referring to is how we can be addressing the sense of the stranglehold of helplessness, insignificance and solitude. That stranglehold, he argues, can only be redeemed not by scientific, but by a kind of mythological or cosmological understanding of our relationship to the world as a whole and the cosmos. So in that sense, the water becomes a conductor, a medium for a sense of companionship, and it becomes a principle through which we can create the world anew. So the key first point, in a sense, that comes out of this story of creation is this need for companionship, a sense of breaking down the barriers of isolation and connection and finding new connections and giving form to the possibility of that kind of connected world view. So one of the starting points for Burge's understanding of creation 
comes from this desire for companionship. Now we talk a lot about the issues of globalization and how it's produced a kind of stronger sense of interconnectedness. This kind of companionship that I think that is being intimated in this, in this text is not just this companionship of ourselves in the world in the terrestrial sense, but it's something wider, something more celestial, and therefore I'm stressing the cosmological dimensions of the notion of creation and companionship. And ironically, while I've just mentioned the term globalization, in the same collection, there are two other essays, one on Edouard Glissant and the other one on Dickinson and Spinoza, which also talk about the fighting and struggle of resistance and oppressions in this colonized world and how they are also expressive of a desire to create a world anew. Now, this idea that I'm stressing of companionship, I think, takes us more fundamentally, not to the mysteries of creation and origin, but rather, nor to that traditional sense of artist as autogenesis, that the more romantically oriented and more surrealistly um, inspired um, critics like Herbert Reed and Ke Kenneth Clark talked about at the same time as Berger in the 60s and 70s, but rather they take us more to something more banal perhaps, to the idea of being with others and through this idea of collaboration. How you receive signs from the world as a whole and your relationship with others. How the artist, in a sense, is a beneficiary of the reception of these signs and how the creative process is the struggle and the ability to give form to that which is received. So from this idea of companionship, I now want to stress the concept of collaboration and how the idea of collaboration and then how the idea of place is also evoked in Berger's writing. First of all, let me stress that the principle of collaboration in Berger's writing is not an instrumental kind of notion of collaboration where you utilise the experience of other people to help you advance your own cause. Rather, it is a principle of equality and sharing and activation of all the elements and all the parties and all the agents in the process. Everyone, in the sense, in the process of participating is in the act of giving and that through this process of collaboration there is a steady and subtle form of recognition that occurs through the practice of transformation. This again borders on the mystical and there is a lot of theological debates, especially among, um, amongst the ancient Greeks, around the idea of kenosis, how the emptying of the self achieves this higher state of transformation how, and how it opens itself up for the reception of a higher principle or higher body and therefore utterly overtakes the subject and enables a union with the divine. Now, in a sense, that kind of procedure is not fundamentally different to what Berger is talking about, but it is not towards this union with the divine, but rather that it is through this encounter with the other that produces both a transformation in one's own identity and an acceptance of the need for recognition by the other. And in that exchange between the desire for your own reception of the other and their need for recognition, something wonderful happens in that oscillation that enables both to mutually be overtaken. Both the subject and the object, both the, both the artist and the sitter in the story of, of drawing, for instance, are transformed in the encounter. And Berger um, has unpacked this process of collaboration in great detail, often in correspondences with artists. He's a prolific um, uh, writer of letters and, and often these letters are published. And a wonderful exchange between the artist Leon Kossuth, 
and 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 John Berger also appears in 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 this collection the shape of a pocket and in that exchange of letters you see the steps that occur in this process of collaboration this step by which the subject's body falls away and the artist is overtaken by the experience of collaboration and another curious feeling and story that unfolds in that story is also the account of the place of the studio. The place of the studio, of course, is something that's almost disappeared in the contemporary society and has become the subject of a great deal of romantic um, critique and hagiography, etc. But what's interesting in Berger's and Leon Kossuth's and a number of other uh, essays that Berger has written about artists is the way in which the studio is often seen as a, as a very banal kind of productive zone. In that essay, they talk about the, the studio as a kind of stomach place, a place for digestion, transformation and excretion. In his essay on Brancusi, he talks about it like a, as if it was a bakery where you make things. But in each place, they're talking about it's the work that it's a place where work happens, but it also induces this feeling of well-being. Now, I will talk a little bit more towards the end about this feeling of well-being and where it comes from and how this feeling of well-being is also related to this ability and, in a sense, this freedom to create a world. How the studio and art making itself is a place where you can create the world anew and you can arrange things in a certain kind of order so that that sense of well-being is critical. Now, I will also suggest later that this notion of arrangement is critical to our understanding of the world itself. Because underlying everything I'm saying is the term cosmos. Cosmos, of course, is the ancient Greek word for the world as a whole. It also refers to the notion of a people and our connection with others. To be part of a cosmos is to be part of the world. It's also to be part of a group of people, the humanity. But cosmos also refers to the principle of arrangement. Hence, we have the term cosmetic. Arrangement, creating order, is fundamentally a banal thing like the way in which you arrange things in your office, the way in which you decorate your flat, the way in which you order your garden, is to create a place of repose and well-being in which and through which you can construct your sense of how things should be in the world as a whole. Now, that is um, a bit of a parenthesis, but I believe it's also central to the way in which we understand the process of collaboration and production and creation. And, and this idea that the artist is a receiver of images and symbols and an arranger of things that come to them. In that sense, Burgess stresses in his exchange with Kosov that the artist is like a good host. Of course, this term host takes us in two directions. One is the principle of hospitality, the reception of the others, and the other is the principle that's also contained in the, in the concept of hospitality, in your own autonomy. Now, the good host does not abandon himself and relinquish all his values in their reception of others. And similarly, the art, what is curious about the, other, the artist, the stories that Berger traces in artists, is that even when he is emphasising this collaborative dynamic, this interaction, this oscillation, this interplay with others. What is interesting is the emergence of an understanding also of a persistence in thematic or methodological or procedural approach. That a, a kind of continuous subject is slowly and con unfolding from one work to the other. A recurrence, a reiteration, a struggle to get it right again and again and a repetitive urge to articulate something that's coming out of a core 
principle or core process or core understanding, but is implicit in everything that this artist is doing. It's like fingerprints, at one point he says. And throughout Burgess' writing, he's trying to understand what it is about each artist's work that has, and what this quality that appears in each artist's work. At one point he says, every convincing painting makes a spatial system of its own. This appears very early on in, in a collection of essays called About Looking. And it repeats, this principle can in a sense be, is repeated throughout all of his criticism, where he talks about place and place as an active zone, as a, as a place where something imperceptible is being articulated, but also as an organising principle. Place is a kind of ambient um, principle that's everywhere but can't be precisely located. And he talks about this in a very complex way, again in this collection, The Shape of a Pocket. And I'll read this passage when he's referring to another Spanish artist who he's had many exchanges with, M Miguel Barcello, and he talks about the way in which place is being constituted in the work of art itself. He says, the painter is continually trying to discover, to stumble upon the place which will contain and surround his present act of painting. Ideally, there should be as many places as there are paintings. The trouble is that a painting often fails to become a place. When a place is found, it is somewhere on the frontier between nature and art. It is a, like a hollow in the sand within which the frontier has been wiped out. The place of the painting begins in this hollow, begins with a practice, with something being done by the hands, and the hands seeking the approval of the eye until the whole body is involved in the hollow. So this story, this passage, this account of the significance of place, the constitutive force of place in art, I believe is drawing us to focus on both the very specificity of a set of forces that appear, or the references that appear in a painting, and a broader generality, a broader kind of topography that's both inclusive of the perspective of others so that even though we might not be someone who shares the same coordinates or historical experience as the artist, that we too can project ourselves into that kind of space so that it becomes a kind of topography that includes others but also does, does never relinquish its own specificities. And that is this mercurial kind of um, um, process. This is this attention that appears in the more recent work and also a kind of attention that's also I think central to this beautiful sort of story called Bento's sketchbook. This attention again I would, I would argue is implicit in the essays that are found in About Looking but fundamentally different as well. Let me explain. In Bento's sketchbook and in what I've just read, there's a sort of attention to the specificity of the sense of place that a storyteller is trying to bestow. But there's also attention to the way in which we learn to identify with the kind of arrangement, the way in which an artist connects things, and that our appreciation of the artwork itself, in a sense, becomes a consequence of our capacity to start to follow the way in which the artist has a peculiar kind of habit of arranging things, how they put one thing beside another, why they choose to quote from here and then from there, why they take us from one optic and then into another. So this kind of procedure, this kind of way of arranging things, this kind of storytelling as cosmos, as cosmetic, as making a world, is both 
an activity that is unique to a particular artist, but one that includes and invites us to take our place in that world and take it for ourselves. This kind of attention was implicit in the way in which John Berger talked about other artists like Millet and Courbet and Ahmed and their own struggles to find a truth in the genre of painting. But I think it's become more um, conscious when he struggles to himself define the way in which art makes w a world and how art is a worldly or world view making practice. What do I mean by this worldliness of art? It's not like globalizing because by globalizing we often think of how we interconnect the parts to be able to control them, to integrate them, to produce a sense of totality through control. So the parts are integrated together to produce a greater sense of the whole, a more coordinated, more powerful, in a sense, more controlling emphasis on the, on the universe. That is a familiar discourse that every politician and businessman is quite happy to promote under the rubrics and headings of globalization. What I think we're talking about here and under the headings of aesthetics is a worldliness which is open to a process of becoming with the parts, not between the parts in service of a whole. So it's an, a becoming open to the whole rather than a controlling of the parts into a new whole. This perspective of the world through arrangement, through openness, is, I think, constitutive of a different kind of worldview, different to the political and economic discourses that are dominating our perspectives on, on the world as a whole. So in conclusion, let me now stress some of the points that have been at the core of my attempt to account for the shift in John's writing. Like I said, at the beginning, the obvious way of reading John Berger's work was to see how he was trying to articulate, to be a spokesperson of the changes that art was intimating, how it could contribute to a transformation of the world towards the pursuit of justice, solidarity and truth. Now, I think a more obtuse, more obscure, more, but nevertheless just as real and material kind of perspective is operative in Burge's writing. The political objectives have not changed. However, the attention to the process of creativity has highlighted how our sensory awareness of the world also produces a kind of world in itself. And how that sensory awareness is more complex and more mysterious than we previously had given it credit for. And he himself, Berger, has not been able to define it in a once and for all kind of way. He hasn't been able to say, this is what it is, and these are the steps that we take to get to it. Whenever he makes an account of these changes, he uses kind of ambiguous kind of stories, sometimes about dreams, sometimes about memories, sometimes about illusions or personas that he's seen in a fleeting and ghostly kind of way. And he talks about himself, therefore, as someone who's appeared in a dream, as a dealer of appearances. But the effort in these characters that is articulated through their persona is the effort to get deeper inside things, to, re to rearrange things, to create this cosmos through a decorative and order-giving activity. And in effect, the principle of hospitality is constantly coming back to us through this collaborative practice of receiving signs and making work. Because the function of place, he argues, is to welcome the absent. He says this in a number of places, but the key point that he is stressing is that place is an order-making activity. 
Now let me conclude by drawing our attention to another passage from a marvelous essay on Degas that also appears in the shape of a pocket, where he talks about this order making activity. And note, I want to highlight the conclusion in that essay where Berger finds a kind of harmonic union in Degas between the particular and the universal and then brings it back to the absolute recognition that a mother has for a child. He says, watching the, and he's talking about a painting by Degas, watching the woman standing on one leg and drying her foot. We are happy for what has been recognized and admitted. We feel the existent recalling its own creation. Before there was any fatigue. And then later on he says, do we not all dream of being known, known by our backs, legs, buttocks, shoulders, elbows, hair, just nakedly known, known as a child is by its mother. Now, this point of being known in this precise sense, but being known in a way that becomes central to the whole story of creation, I have argued was implicit in all of John Berger's earlier work. It was certainly implicit in the way he talked about photography as a kind of translucent form of, of the documentary. It was implicit in the way he talked about the relationship between practice and theory. It was implicit in the way in which he talked about eternity in the world. But I think it's, it's now that it's something that has taken us closer to the way in which art has been seen as a world-making activity and art as a way of inducing and exuding a sense of well-being. Now I'm highlighting these points, these fundamental categories, not because I want to emphasize a sort of mystical regression, on the contrary, as I said at the beginning, because I want to emphasize the need to rethink categories like the universal. Obviously the old metaphysics and certainly the, the idea of the divine as a, as a point from which the universal originates from is not what is at stake here. What is at stake, however, is a way of thinking about the universal in a more concrete, in a more down-to-earth, but also in a more subtle and intimate way. It is a way of thinking about how the idea of the universal may help us rethink the way in which we actually belong to this world. Thank you.